Hello and welcome to the Test of Time, where today's guest met his name here at the Oval, following the footsteps of his father. We go back to Sydney 2003, when it was my first Ashes series, and what turned out to be Mark Butcher's last. If the Harmison gets his reward, been a brilliant spell of bowling. Harmison bowled a superb opening spell. Five wickets for Stephen Harmison. Butch, thanks for joining us on the test of time. We're going to uh, talk about Sydney, Australia versus England, 2003. Um, I think the first question I'd like to ask, because this is my first tour, um, second test match was in Adelaide, uh, where your headspace was, because you played against Australia before. I was young, naive. Um, literally just wanted a ball fast and just over the moon I was playing cricket for England. Um, but there was a lot of stuff that went on before. You know, we had literally 20 odd players. You can think Goff, Flintoff, uh, Simon Jones, Ashley Giles, all gone home before Adelaide, second test match. We've got a team that's, you know, just been fudged together. Uh, and we're 4 0 down, sitting underneath Hitch Sydney Harbour. Um, where's Mark Butcher, probably one of the more experienced players as head space, <laughs> going into the, the last Test match? Um, well, look, I mean, on a personal level, um, Tor hadn't gone as, as as I would have liked to, to have done. Um, started off making a few runs at uh, Brisbane. Had always been a ground I'd, I'd love playing at. I played a tour games there, and I made my you know my second Test hundred at, at Brisbane. Um, and so, sort of started off well there um, in the in the um, we'll have a we'll have a bowl <laughs> debacle game, um, and, but we got hammered. You know, obviously we got absolutely hammered in that game, and that and that continued throughout the rest of the trip. So, any sort of any good feeling there was um, personally, sort of leading into Brisbane and then out of Brisbane again, had kind of been wiped away by the time we got to to Sydney. Um, and as you said, the team the team was kind of. You know what's that? What's that thing on Battlestar Galactica where they talk about a ragtag <laughs> band of, you know, busted up, busted up old ships and whatever, trying to trying to hold themselves together before they get back to England. You know, it was kind of like that. Um, it, we'd had a little bit of a break, hadn't we? There, there was the, um, you know, there was a sort of a, a one yeah. day section of the tour that came in after we'd lost the Ashes in Perth. You know, that was all, all over and done with very, very quickly, wasn't it? And um, by the time, you know, the actual ashes themselves were done. And then we played OK in, in Melbourne. I remember you mm. bowling the speed of light in Melbourne and scaring the bejesus out of um, out of Steve Waugh in particular in the second dig there. I mean, you know, typical. One of the things that summed that up was that Vaughan has, has batted better than I, I, I've ever seen another human bat throughout this series. And he made another 190 in the Boxing Day Test match at Melbourne to kind of keep us in a game that we had no right to be in. And then with that, with Australia chasing not many in the last innings, um, you know, and Steve Waugh's career on the line again, um, you nicked him off, didn't you? You kind of didn't you didn't you get him to run one straight off the face of the bat to Chris Reed and and the, the Barmy Army were making such a noise in the in the Great Southern Stand behind us that nobody heard it. Um, and you know we we might who knows who knows what might have happened had that that wicket been taken at the time in that sort of short run chase we, you know we'd done it to Australia mm. before on the same ground so it was just everything was everything was a nightmare no, you know nothing was right we didn't feel like we were we didn't feel like we were a team you know we had sort of youngsters like yourselves sort of coming in for your your first trip first Ashes trip old blokes like me had been around a little bit and had kind of seen it and done it all before. In terms of the way that um, those trips can go south, so uh, by the time we get to Sydney, it's kind of like, well, you know, we've had a bit of a laugh, haven't we, on the on the harbour yeah. uh, on New Year's Eve, and it kind of, there was a, there was a slight feeling of right, well, you know, it can't get any worse. Let's just go out and just have a have a, have a bit of fun, you know, enjoy ourselves um, for this test match, um, and you know, what's what's the worst that could possibly happen? That's already happened on this trip. Uh, but you come to yeah. we come to the the actual test match, and NASA wins a toss again. You know, look as though we're playing on a on a wicket, which is typical Sydney. It's going to break up. Um, no Warner McGraw, which is great for us. Um, and Vaughan, yeah. who's batted unbelievable all all four test matches, come into it, gets a seven ball duck, and out walks Mark Butcher. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of, you know, walked out there and thought, decent pitch at Sydney. You're right, no, no Warren and, and, and no McGrath, which is always a bonus. Um, but you know, still, <laughs> it's still going to be hard work against this lot, as it always was. Um, and you know, I had a bit of luck. I think um, Adam Gilchrist dropped me. Um, after lunch, you know, I managed to battle through to lunch and got dropped, I think, just after lunch. Did, I never really played great, but by the time, by sort of like the back end of the day, um, I'd started to feel a bit bored, bored myself um, and, had, uh, you know, and, and had made 100, another 100 in, in Australia, another 100 in the Ashes. Um, the best thing about all of that was, Steve, was that my, um, my mates, guys that I went to school with um, from sort of the age of seven or eight uh, back home here in Croydon had come out to uh to see the, the the new year's and the uh and the 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 christmas boxing day test match um so the kemba brothers and, and a guy called mark but butterworth came out um and they've had these these um, jedi cloaks made so they come out in the mornings and they would sit down with the hoods up you know when recovering from the hangovers <laughs> sort of at the, at the beginning of the day's play and then by the evening session that they're off and they're leaping around with the barmy army come the evening I don't know why I bothered getting them bloody uh, hospitality tickets because they never used them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, I managed. I made a hundred hundred at Sydney, which has always been one of my favourite cricket grounds in the world. Um, and some of my closest friends from from sort of back in the day were were there to see it. So, you know, it was a, it was a hell of a hell of a good day for me. That one. you get to you got 100 you're 42 at lunch batting with uh batting with nasa um what was it like yeah. the atmosphere out there not only batting with you know captain grumpy but you know the the the, 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 the buzz the noise there was 44,000 people there on the 3rd of january it was an amazing atmosphere yeah incredible it was hot too i remember it being mm. i remember sort of struggling a bit with cramps sort of late late into the the final session of the day um, it was roasting, and we had a we had an absolute ton of of English fans out there. So the atmosphere was incredible, and that would only you know that would only get better as the as the Test match went along. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those one of those moments, Steve, that you kind of you know look back on your career. And I don't I don't miss playing a great deal now, but there are certain things you know. That's I, there's a photograph. I have a, a photograph somewhere in a box somewhere. Um, of, of sort of me with my bat up with the with the, that whole bank of English yeah. fans behind me in the sort of in the distance. And it's one of those things that sends a little little chill up the spine. Um, and batting with Nash, you know, he and I always had, even though we couldn't have been more different in terms of our characters um, off the field, well, on the field probably too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we always, we always, yeah, we always, <laughs> we always had quite a lot of good partnerships together. There was something in that, you know, in the way that, in the way that we went about things, you know, he, he kept me awake, and I, I stopped him from sort of wringing the uh, the back grip off his off his bat handle. You know, tried to keep him calm. So it was it was something that worked nicely, and we had a lot of over the years we had quite a lot of good partnerships. In that that partnership, actually, I want to delve a little bit more into that partnership because Nas is the one on the end of the the four nil at before we all started. Nas is the one that the Australian media is having a go at every time there was a. A boundary. The big screen got NASA because he was kicking the dirt, throwing his cap, or shouting at one of us. <laughs> and what was it like being out there with Nash? Nash got seventy-five, and it, it must have been. You're talking about two contrasting characters, where you know, you're laid back, you know, having a bit of fun, and you know, I know it's serious when you're in the middle. But Nasser's far from that. He had the world on his shoulders. Yeah. He's got a team that's just been beat four 0 lost the Ashes in 12, 12 days. All of a sudden, he, he just released a little bit. He got seventy five, but it must have been interesting batting with him in the, in the middle. Yeah, I mean, he. The thing is, he he spent virtually his entire career like that. I mean, if if put it this way, if 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 Nas had captained sort of the teams that, um, you know, maybe maybe some of the teams that Alistair Cook had the the, the chance to captain or Andrew Strauss had the chance to captain in that in that era, he would have been the same guy. You know, he needed that mm. um that angst and that sort of. That battle, so I don't think that was that that didn't bother him particularly. I think that the thing about him that people that don't know him sort of misunderstand is that there is you know as though that there it's as though there's sort of a fear behind it or that there's um um a 
a negativity behind it. It wasn't that. He was just he was just so passionate about England winning, about us not not being pushed around by the Australians, about English cricket giving a good account of itself. Um, and he were, and he dragged a lot of us along with him on that on that road. And you know, by the time he left, and by the time you know, my, by the time I was done, everything was in a damn sight better place than it was when we all started. And I think that was yeah. that was always his driving thing. And of course, you know, he 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 was desperate to score a gazillion runs. You know, he wanted to be one of the best players in the world. And he he and I were both <laughs> both realistic enough to know that 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 kind of wasn't going to be the case. There were some serious players around at the time. But that you would, you know, you would fight your corner, um, and um, you know, and, and and do the very, very best that you could, because it because it meant something. An 150 partnership with Nas, um, you get to T, um, England 200, I think, um, and then you go on. Nervous 90s. Was there was there any nerves? Did Mark Butcher have any nerves when it come to it? Um, he said you had felt a little bit lean, but was there any nerves in the 90s? Um, out in the middle of the SCG. I can't. I can't remember there being any. You know, I. I kind of. It never used to bother me. Once. Sort of once you got that far, it was kind of like, well, you know, it wasn't like I was going to run down and try and dong it back over the bowler's head for six because I didn't do that anyway. It was just. It was. A, it was simply a case of, well, you've made this many. Why? Why? Why wouldn't you? Even if it takes. Even if it takes another two hours, why wouldn't you get the rest? You know. Um, but uh, it was just. I think. I think mainly it, I was I was battling a little bit physically, you know. I kind of we we had had quite a good night on that on that New Year's, and, <laughs> and I think it might, you know, don't don't do don't try this at home, kids. But you know, it, it might well have caught up with me sort of late on late on after tea. And England ended the day on two hundred and fifty, which is a pretty good day for for us, to be fair. In that in that series, um, you go into day two, we managed to get. Oh, what did we get? We got a, a decent size, I thought, first innings total, 362. And then Australia come out to to bat second, um, second on the second day, um, who have batted very, very well. And it's, it'll be remembered for the Steve Waugh day. He comes out to bat. What was that time? It was, it was 25 past three when he came out to bat. And yeah. everybody had him that this is his last test match. This is his last test, you know, we, we, the crowd was ridiculous, 40-odd thousand people. Can you remember yeah. to me what was going through? Mate, it was, it, was de- it was deafening. It was, at, you know, yeah. we'd, we'd had quite a good day again. You know, we'd managed managed not to get slogged everywhere by Matt Hayden. And we kind of, you know, we had, we, we'd taken a few wickets and things were, things were going all right. You'd bowled pretty well. Caddy was going good. Hoggy was going all right. Um, and then Steve Wall walks out to this absolute, crescendo of noise from um, obviously his home ground at the SCG and he proceeded to go to play in a way that I don't think I ever saw him play um, you know since since then or before then in a, in a test match um, for Australia he came out and flayed it everywhere um, and you know with every with every run the crowd just got noisier and noisier and noisier until the end you just could not you couldn't hear yourself think out there uh, Nas had kind of given up, you know, trying to attract people's attention and all that kind of stuff. We were just, we were literally on autopilot towards the end. Um, and I, I remember when he got that, that bit of the, the theatre at the end, you know, Nas makes him wait for the last ball and Rich, poor old Richard Dawson's kind of thinking, well, what, what do I bowl here? And we, and we all, and I'm kind of standing there at slip thinking, I'm not sure I was at slip actually because Dawson was bowling. But anyway, I'm sort of thinking to myself, he's got to go for it, hasn't he? I mean, the, the whole thing was yeah. just so theatrical. Um, and that the atmosphere was just so electric. I've never ever been on a cricket field like that before. And of course, he crashes the square drive um, through cover four and goes to the hundred, and kind of his arms go aloft. And the cra- and it's bedlam. It's absolute bedlam. I've never ever heard anything like it. You know that you've seen at the end. I've, pro- I've probably said this to you before. The scene at the end of um, Escape to Victory, when the French, when yeah. the uh, when the team beats the, the Germans in the football match. And the crowd are all yelling "Victoire, Victoire!" On the field, yeah, Victoire, yeah. yeah. Right, so it sounded exactly in my ears. Steve War sounded exactly <laughs> like Victoire. It was like you know, it was like the liberation, <laughs> the liberation of northern France Black after. Like Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, mate, on, yeah. it was, it was, it was spine tingling. And it gets another one of those. That's why I chose this test match. It's kind of like it just kept having these moments in the test. I couldn't 
believe this was like this is my fourth test match, fifth test match. Naivety. It was like <laughs> this is real now. I'd played the MCG the week before, and I'm like, what is this noise? Normally by what ten to ten to six on a on the second day of a test match, there's gone from forty thousand to ten thousand. But there was actually nobody had left the stadium. Yeah. This was the end for Steve Waugh. This was his his moment. And like you say, I, I, I wasn't I so much willing it to go for four, but I was like, this has got to end him getting a hundred today because if it doesn't, you know, this is going to be the biggest anti thing that you've you've ever seen. But when you you look <laughs> and you, you you see what happened, I think when he got to sixty nine, he reached ten thousand uh, runs in Test match cricket. That's the third player behind Gavaskar and Border. Um, and yeah, he, he was, he it was just, it was amazing. And this was, this was Steve Ward's last Ashes Test match. You know, it's you know, quite a few people's last Ashes Test match. Was this mm. the best side that you ever played against? And was this the best side that, that played Test match cricket? Hard, hard to say ever. The best, well, I mean, there. yeah. Well, I mean, I, pl- I, I played against so the the ninety seven vintage, where it was, um, you know, you had the likes of Michael Slater and and uh, still opening the bang. Obviously, Mark Wall wasn't part of the two thousand two three mm. side then, um, but then you know Matthew Hayden wasn't the player that he that he became uh, before then. Adam Gilchrist wasn't around. It was it was Ian Healy before him. McGrath was a constant, obviously. Um, Gillespie, Gillespie. I mean, again, somebody like Dizzy, who gets, who's remembered always, really, for the 2005 Ashes here. But people kind of somehow have forgotten what yeah. an incredible bowler he was Definitely. between '97 and and up before then. You know, he was one of the best I faced anywhere. And of course, you know, Warney as well. Um, and then if you didn't have Warney, you had the other nutcase, McGill. <laughs> you know, who was who would have played. A hundred Test matches if if he'd, if he'd been born anywhere else. So, um, you know, they were they were they were pretty special team. I mean, the the, the thing was it was somebody like Damian Martin, for example. You know, sort of unsung player. Mm. Um, because again, because in English eyes, he didn't. You know, he disappeared in the in the two thousand and five Ashes series. Up until that point, he probably averaged sixty or seventy against this fabulous player. So I mean, the, the, they could just hurt you from so many different places. I think that was the problem. You know, that if if it wasn't if it wasn't Hayden one day, it was Langer the next. If it wasn't Steve War, it was it was uh, you know it was Damian Martin. If it wasn't Damian Martin, it was bloody oh god, you know, you, you name them. They're just coming out. It's Ricky Ponting, Ricky Ponting, for mm. Christ's sake. Um, and then on the bowling side of it, they 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 always you see the the beauty of, of sort of Australian cricket back then was it was very simple. They had they knew that they had three quicks, three different quicks. Um, in McGrath, Gillespie, and a, and a raw slinger like Brett Lee, and then you had two bowlers in one in Warren, You know, holding bowler in the first innings, knockout bowler in the second. So, you know, it was that that, that very rarely changed, or there was very little movement in that in the whole time that I played against them, which it, <laughs> which actually made it worse. You know, because you just knew it was that it was that you were going into the surgery every yeah, single time. Gonna you get you. Uh, and talking about yeah. somebody going to get us, Gilchrist often did at number seven. He gets 100. They get a one-run lead. Yeah. Um, we then obviously go out to bat, and it's Michael Vaughan carried on where he left off in, in the MCG. Um, Vaughan, I think, second yeah. innings, you got 32. Uh, NASA got another 70, and, and Vaughan finished off the tour in ridiculous, ridiculous style. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, again, you, you swap... Swap Vaughan's batting for for Cook's batting in the series that England won ten eleven. You know, there's no mm. comparison, is there? I mean, which is not to not to say any, to, to say anything against Alistair Cook's achievement in that series, which was phenomenal. But Michael Vaughan scored over seven hundred runs in a in a losing a team that lost four um, one, yeah. making making you know hundred and hundred and ninety twice, um, and just batting in a way that again I don't I don't he never batted better than that. It's a bit like I say with you. You never bowled better than you did in the West Indies in two thousand and four. No. He never batted, but he never batted better than than. And I'm no, not, and I'm not sure very many other people in the history of the game ever batted see, as well as Michael Vaughan like did yeah. in two thousand and three. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you yeah, know, I know what you mean. Yeah, I don't think he, I don't think that's a I don't think that's a big statement to to play as well as that over a sustained period of time against a, against a superior team who were beating the crap out of you. Um, that is, you know, and that will be forever. You know that's that's 
my my respect for Michael Vaughan is forever for that mm. series because it was phenomenal. I agree. When you talk about people having, they say they have purple patches or they get in the zone. It's like every they couldn't bowl anywhere. I, I always describe Ponton was the best player I played against because of the size I was. Mm. Anything that was back of a length, he pulled me for six. He didn't try and pull me for four. He was pulling it for six. And anything <laughs> I wasn't quite, I was a little bit over pitched. He'd bang it straight back past you. It's like margin forever. Yeah. There's nowhere to go. And it just seemed in that that test series, that Vaughan he just had, he had all the bowlers on toast, seam bowlers on toast. And he had this slug sweep against Vaughan, a little bit like Peterson in 2005. Um, and he had mm. this up and I'm going to come at you. Um, and everything was going in his favour. And his body was probably at its best. I think his knee was just about to go then. And I don't think his movements were, were quite as fluid after that. But... When you mm. when you see the the way he played, it was just ridiculous. And like I said, we get yeah. to the, we get to the you know the, the final innings. Um, I managed to bag twenty when uh, before yeah. NASA declared. I remember Brett Lee hit me a couple of times in the rib cage after uh-huh. Stewie just managed to throw one down the third man, which NASA was sort of apoplectic when I got back to the dressing room. Well, you see, you won't know this. He you, said you he was protecting his average. I was in the I was in the dressing room. Um, Nas Nas was sat next to Duncan. I mean, we were we were a long way ahead by now, weren't we? Oh, well, well over four hundred. Yeah, yeah. Pitches and the pitch is kind of going a bit up and down. It's dry. I mean, it's been hot, hasn't it? It was red hot for yeah, for, red hot. for yeah. four days. And I'm I'm sort of like I'm watching Stewie knock a single and leave you on strike to Bretley. I think he did it three overs on the trot. And I'm I'm, trot, I'm standing yeah, next to I'm standing next to Nas going, mate, pull him in because he's going to kill him, and we need him to bowl. <laughs> 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 and, yeah. and eventually, you know, I'm standing there like on his shoulder, like this. For God's sake, you know, he's gonna he's gonna break his rib or something, and we're gonna be a bowler down. Bring him, bring him in, bring him anyway. So, so that's what happened. Um, uh, and, I remember uh, that. You know, and, he, he, he hit me in the ribs twice, and I was like, and I remember <laughs> looking at the dressing room, thinking, do I really need to be out here? <laughs> I know I'm young and I'm naive, and this is only my fifth test match, but this guy is bowling <laughs> seriously quick. And I tell you what, you know, a skinny, not, not a fat lad, a skinny Steve Armisen might fall down one of these cracks. I really do not <laughs> want to be out of here with a bat in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, so eventually, anyway, he called him in. And, um, yeah, yeah, we yeah. had, and then, and then, you know, the, the amazing thing, the thing that always happens, um, and then we, we kind of knew this, and we knew this against Australia over the years, was that on the, on the odd occasion where we managed to put, big runs on the board or kind of take advantage of conditions and stuff, they were just as human and, and as fallible and as likely to fall in a heap as we were. Um, and so, you know, we go out there and Hoggy knocks over Hados LBW and Hados smashes up the dressing room on the way back in and they're all having a Barney and stuff. You know, I was thinking, well, Christ, you, you guys have won this 4-0 and, and, and you're losing, you losing your shit. Imagine what we feel like. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, so by the time, by the time we get to the close of, Closing day four, it's it's. I mean, it's not over, but it's pretty much done, isn't it? Um, and we, yeah, we have to come back. They were ninety for one. Bickle batted, batted three, didn't he? They sent Andy Bickle in. It's like a yeah. It wasn't a night watchman. It was a see off the see off the new ball and see. And he he come and have batted a... the best. What did he get? He got big. Got forty nine, didn't he? And yeah, caddy ball beautifully. Yeah, this, this, yeah. It's such a, it's not not so much a shame or I mean, that. You know, everything evolves and people move on, but. Caddy's last ever test match, nobody would believe co walking off at Sydney that Andrew Caddick would never play cricket never again. Play, yeah. He bowled, he bowled unbelievable on a wicket, which was obviously helped the tall fast bowler because it was it was um, it was cracked, it was there was good big holes in it. And I must admit mm. we got some very, very good assistance from Russell Tiffin, because I remember getting <laughs> Damian Martin out. And he didn't middle it. Actually, he hit, he hit this one. He actually hit the one in 2003, I think, harder than the one he hit in 2005 <laughs> when we managed to wake Steve Buckner up when he gave it out. But we got some, we got, we got some luck in caddy bowl beautifully. Yeah, he did. He did. And, you know, again, you're sort of standing at slip and the thing is flying through from the pair of you, a little bit up and down. And, and again, you know, by, by now you've got the original... Um, it's just the it's just the English in in the SCG now that the Aussies don't turn up when they're losing. So we had um, I don't know 15,000, 15, 20,000 maybe English fans in the ground and not and not very much of anything else. So the noise was was deafening and it was all one way. I remember walking around the ground, Butch. I remember yeah. walking around the ground and that was that was everything worthwhile for me. That a realization of 
I've just played Australia for the first time in the series in, mm. in, in an Ashes series. This was my fifth Test match, which four of them were against this great side, and I felt well, I might only got nine, ten wickets, but I felt if I can go home with this experience, I can play against anybody. And I walked mm. around the ground. Caddy got seven for ninety. You know, we finished the finished the job off. He gets McGill. We I get a stump. We go round the ground, right to the far end. There's twenty odd thousand. There was one hundred eighty one thousand all told over five days at the ground. The Barmy Army were unbelievable. And I remember standing in front of the Barmy Army, and I just like, this is what I want to do. This is what I, you know, you were at a different end of your career, coming coming sort of, you know, having been there before. This was like, I want to play here. I want to play against this every single week. It was yeah. an amazing atmosphere. Yeah, it was incredible. And you know, and those those fans. Again, it's not a, it's not something that, that happens. You don't sort of get this sort of feeling of sentimentality whilst you're on the trips, but you do realise no. that you know you've kind of you've you've not put up the, the greatest show in the world for them. Um, you know they've come down and they've probably caught hell from every single Australian taxi driver and hotelier or whatever, and just <laughs> given them abuse about how terrible their team is. And so to be able to go over and sort of stand in front of them and, and thank them and you know and and give them a victory to to go off into the night with or into the afternoon with as it turned out um you know it was a, yeah, it was, it was, a it was a great thing it was it was it was seven i, I was be, doing the research on it and i've seen a video it was seven minutes past two when kelly gets stuart mcgill um <laughs> and you talk about going in the dressing room and i do remember going in the dressing room and i tell you what it was one of the best experiences i've had i'm talking to steve war and glenn mcgrath about playing cricket play yeah. cricket One's played 150 test matches and the other one's got about, at the time, about 300 odd test match wickets. It doesn't get any better for somebody who's young, naive, 24, you know, on the road. And I remember going through and going through and we had a good time. It was, it was frowned upon going in the opposition dressing room, but there was about five or, f five or six did. And we didn't leave till after about 10 o'clock at night. It's not a great story we should be telling, but I do remember <laughs> when I went back. Well, when I, I, was, back I was one, one of the five. Days, the dressing room attendant, Rocky, well, you were one of the five. I'm going to call them out, Foster, Crawley, Harmison, Butcher, Key. And I remember when I went back, because I remember vaguely about what happened, and I know more now because other people have put me on the bones, but Rocky, the dressing room attendant, he went ballistic. He went, you, I want to see you. He went, you took my golf cart. And I was like, did I? <laughs> yeah, we might, we might have borrowed his oh. golf cart. We might have borrowed his golf cart, and we might have <laughs> because the team left us, didn't they? The um, the they the, did. the rest of the lads yeah. left left us behind, so we ended up hitchhiking in our full England tracksuit regalia back to uh, back to Central Sydney from uh, from the ground because we had no way of getting home. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there 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 are other bits to the story, but that's probably best left to after we're uh, we're we're beyond a resting age. <laughs> no, I just remember. I remember. I remember standing on the side of a dual carriageway, just flagging down a car coming back. And here I am with my England tracksuit, my accreditation badge over me, over me neck, and just somebody just picked us up. The two cars stopped and picked us up. And for me, that was the that story. That story was a, a great end to a fantastic Test match because I'd had a good time playing representing England mm. and had a great time in a dressing room having a party with, me, with some of my best mates who have been best mates for, forever. So yeah. it was a, it was a fantastic time, Butch. Um, I just want to say thanks very much for giving your, your experience at the test of time and, and a, a memorable match that I will never ever forget, but a fantastic one for yourself. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, anytime.